This is going to be a very special program. We are concentrating upon the high altitude observatories on Mauna Kea, the extinct volcano in Hawaii. I mean, we hope it's extinct. Up there, some of the world's best astronomical telescopes. And Chris is there. Down here, I'll be talking to some of the astronomers who use them. So, first of all, over to Chris in Hawaii. Welcome to the summit of Mauna Kea, the highest mountain in the world. Sacred to the native Hawaiian people, it's also the closest astronomers come to our holy site. The 13 telescopes up here study the universe in wavelengths from optical through to the radio and look at everything from star formation to distant galaxies and from supernova to extrasolar planets. The results are incredible. Choosing different wavelengths means tuning into environments at different temperatures and seeing different parts of the universe. Both gamma and x-rays, along with most of the ultraviolet, will be blocked by the atmosphere. But Keck, working in the optical, will see things very differently from the UK infrared telescope. Eukert's view, on the other hand, will be different again from the cold and dusty universe seen by the James Clark Maxwell telescope in the submillimeter. Mauna Kea is classed as a dormant volcano, and it's impossible to ignore the signs of activity, from the beautiful coloured soil to the cinder cones which pepper the side of the mountain behind me, each one marking the site of a previously active vent. The last eruption is believed to have taken place just 4,000 years ago, and Mauna Loa, our neighbour, is still very much active. Despite the volcanoes, being smack in the middle of a large Pacific island has several advantages. The atmosphere above us is extremely dry, vital for many observations. In addition, the cloud tends to stay down below in what's known as the inversion layer, leaving the summit nice and clear with stable seeing conditions. Opened in 1979, for 13 years the largest mirror on the mountain belonged to the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope, or UKIRT. Recently updated, it's still the largest telescope anywhere in the world dedicated to these wavelengths. UKIRT owes its success to its superb mirror, good enough for optical astronomy, let alone the dark and dusty infrared. It's this, together with a succession of new instruments that have kept it at the cutting edge of infrared astronomy for so long. The latest instrument, WIFCAM, the wide field camera, is the large black cannon attached to the telescope behind me, and there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. Tonight, the new camera is being treated to a tour around several parts of the sky that should be familiar to observers back in the UK. Here to set up for tonight's run is Dr Andy Adamson, director of UKIRT. So we're in front of UKIRT, but why the infrared anyway? Well, if you asked me that question 25 years ago, you'd get a different answer from now. I suppose when UKIRT was first built, uh, it was a really pioneering telescope and infrared astronomy was very much in its infancy. The reasons for infrared now, I suppose, are, are twofold. Uh, one is that the universe is expanding. Um, and so the very distant targets, which are, are needed to look at for, for cosmological reasons, tend to be at very large redshifts. When we talk about um, more nearby things in our own galaxy, for example, the star formation that goes on um, is all enshrouded in dust. Uh, you don't see much of this in the visible light, um, and you do see it in the infrared, and that's a, a very key driver for infrared astronomy. Um, we also uh, see through dust very well. Uh, so, for example, uh, we see through to the centre of our own galaxy uh, in a way that you just cannot do in visible light at all. So. And throughout this evolving field, UKIRT's kept up to date by new instruments, like the one on the telescope behind us. Yes, the, the rather strange instrument on the telescope behind us is the latest in a series of instruments which have been delivered to the telescope over the last decade. Our original instruments were, were typically of this sort of size. You could hold them in, in, your, in your arms, and we have some of those down in Hilo. Um, now they're the size of getting on for a car uh, and a cannon, as someone described it earlier. When the telescope first opened, we were operating with single pixel detectors. And now we're working with four detectors, each of which has four million pixels. And that's basically advances in technology over the last decade or so. And I know you're hoping that WIFCAM will reclaim a record that UKIRT's held before. Yes, we expect that UKIRT will, in the next few years, we're, we're just launching into a large sky survey uh, in the infrared. Um, one part of that survey is almost bound to produce both the nearest object in the known universe outside of our solar system and the furthest object in the, in the universe, all within the same survey. So we should hold the quasar redshift record once again.
Funded by the UK Research Council, PPARC, British scientists get the chance to play with this fabulous instrument. Dr Sandy Leggett and Dr Chris Davis are resident astronomers here, coordinating observations as well as carrying out their own research. One of the great advantages of observing in the infrared, especially for star formation, is that it allows us to peer deep inside dark molecular clouds where young stars are actually being formed. And we've got some wonderful examples of that, like the Chicken Nebula. Yeah, the Chicken's a nice example. This is a high mass star forming region. We've been studying it uh, at uh, UKIRT. And uh, again, if you look at an optical image of this region, all you see is the very brightest stars. Um, but in the infrared, obviously, we can peer inside the cloud and see all this wonderful structure. And a wonderful image of our nearest large star-forming region, Orion. With our new wide-field camera, WIFCAM, Orion was one of our first targets, and uh, 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 WIFCAM has, has revealed uh, fabulous structure over a huge area. Not just the young stars, but also a lot of dynamical processes, outflows. These are uh, remarkable uh, phenomena associated with young stars. Basically, what's happening is um, as the star is forming, material is spiralling down through a, a flattened disk, what we call an accretion disk, so gas is accreting onto the star, and as it gets closer and closer to the star, it gets faster and faster. So to slow the spiralling down, the object actually produces outflows, um, and these are remarkable uh, jets of gas from the poles of the star, uh, travelling at hundreds of kilometres per second, um, extending over millions of kilometres across space. And so we've talked about star formation, but Sandy, you've been looking at small stars. Well, brown dwarfs are between a star and a, a planet in terms of uh, temperature and mass. They're actually too cold and they don't have sufficient mass to ignite hydrogen nuclear fusion in their core, so they don't shine like stars. But they still they start off very hot when they're formed out of the uh, molecular gas, so they, they can still shine for up to a billion years. And you, Kurt, played a crucial role in their discovery. Oh yes. We were looking for brown dwarfs for decades, from through the 70s and the 80s, and finally in 1995 one example was found uh, at Palomar as a companion to a, a red dwarf. And we kept looking, we still only had this one example. And in 1999 we found the, the second example of what are now called tea dwarfs, and I, I, would, I observed this just sitting right here, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, just me and the telescope operator. And, I just wanted to tell everybody, it was so exciting, it was, it was terrific. And so the first brown dwarf was found. Splitting its light up and looking at its spectrum, it's obvious that it's more like a planet, here's Saturn's spectrum, than a star shown in red. But there's a missing link. Is there anything that has a spectrum intermediate between a star and a brown dwarf? A year later in 2000, on one night, we found three or four objects which filled in the gap. It was an entire spectral sequence. For the first time it was like a real population and I think that was my best night at any telescope ever and I can't imagine having another night like that. It was just really, really exciting. As the sun sets down into the cloud, it's a race against time to get the telescopes ready for science as soon as possible. Andy and tonight's telescope operator, Thor, have things well under control. The telescope is working well and data is already coming in. Well, it's a clear night outside, and what are we looking at? Uh, well, right now we're in the middle of an observation of M33, which is a, a large spiral galaxy. With previous instrumentation, it would have taken many years to build up an image of this galaxy because it's so large on the sky. This is the optical image? Uh, this is the optical image on, on the sky survey, um, and the, the four patches that you're seeing here are the, the four WIFCAM detectors. Um, each of which is separated by a certain distance, as you can see. And what we're doing is to build up a, a completely covered area around this target um, so that we get a, a complete image of the, of the entire galaxy. We're using three different filters. Um, they're called Z, J and K. Um, the K is the longest wavelength and sees straight through the dust that you can see in patches around here on the optical image. Um, and the Z is, is closer to the optical, but it's still in the infrared. And so we can use the information from all three filters uh, to build up a colour image in the first part, uh, but also to get information on the extinction from dust in the galaxy, uh, to look at the properties of stars. Um, we can resolve individual stars in galaxies this close. So when you say extinction from dust, that's the effect the dust has on the light? Yes, that's right. You can see some patches here of darkness. Um, they're the same as the patches that you see in the Milky Way, um, and they're, they're basically large clouds of dust and gas. 
And this is live data coming through? Yeah, so each of these four um, detectors produces a stream of data that comes in, uh, and each of these is showing you the, both the, the data that are on their way in, so we have a, a, a live frame coming in each time we get an update, and here is the latest stacked image. So up here is the nucleus of the galaxy, and this is out into the disk. So again, you can see that the galaxy is quite large, and we don't see the whole thing in one chip. Auto guiding has been lost. Let's just start it from the top. Not all objects have a convenient guide star right next to them. Oh, yes, no. Especially um, when you're operating in a dark cloud, which we tend to do a lot because we work infrared. And then, of course, when you get outside the galactic plane, as we're doing with this, some of these surveys, it, it gets really bad. We end up with guide stars that are very faint. Let me change the uh, gain on this. You know, if, if something happens now, then you've got to try and save the rest of the night's observation? Absolutely. And, you know, as the minutes count down, you're losing time. And the object is to try and get back on the sky as soon as possible, mm -hmm. collecting the photons. The images from WIFCAM are certainly impressive, and it's only been operating for a few short months. With plenty more clear nights to come, we'll be hearing a lot more from UCURT. UCURT, United Kingdom Infrared Telescope. Most impressive. One astronomer who makes great use of it is Dr. Derek Ward-Thompson of Cardiff University. Welcome back to the sky at night, Derek. Now, first, some people are going to say, we have lovely visual pictures. Why start going into the infrared? We can see an awful lot with, with optical telescopes. There are some marvellous optical telescopes in the world. But, of course, they don't tell us the whole story. And we can perhaps illustrate this with um, a picture here that will be familiar to most people of the Horsehead Nebula. In Orion. In Orion, that's correct. And what you see in an optical picture like this is you see the silhouette. And the reason that you see it in silhouette is because space is full of dust. And it's this dust which is forming the next generation of stars. Inside the nebula. Inside the nebula, that's correct. And the point is that this dust prevents us from seeing into the middle in the optical. But if we go to the longer wavelengths, yes. and you can see here in this longer wavelength picture, suddenly we can see right into the middle of the nebula. Like an X-ray, so to speak. Just like an X-ray of the horse itself. And we can see something that looks as if the horse has swallowed something in its throat. We believe that this is matter that's in the process of forming new stars right in the middle of the horse head nebula and what we can see here in this false color image is the heat from those newly forming stars which was completely obliterated by the dust when we looked in the optical what exactly is this dust ah yes now the dust we believe is made of silicate in other words sand just yeah. like the sand on the beach but the size of the particles is more like the size of particles in for instance cigarette smoke which as you know can easily block out the light and this is what gets in the way of our optical telescopes what about those things often called cosmic bullets. <laughs> yes, we've known for a long time that when a star dies it can be very uh, energetic, yes, indeed. explosive, yes. as we call a supernova. Yes. And now of course we also know that when a star is born it can also be a very energetic event. We have more like an implosion than an explosion as the material crashes together into the center and very often some of that material is thrown out such as this lovely picture here of Orion. You can see the bullets streaking through the nebula and very often these bullets are fired out almost like a jet in a very specific direction presumably along the polar axis of the star that's being formed in the center you know that looking at the Orion nebula either with the naked eye or binoculars it looks a calm, a peaceful place, but there's turmoil going on inside it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a very exciting place. You know, Orion's a lovely constellation. You can see the Orion nebula with the naked eye. Of course, the, the horse's head is much more difficult. But let's look further afield, shall we? Centre of the galaxy, roughly 24, 25,000 light years away. And we can't see it because of the dust, but uh, infrared can. 
That's exactly correct. Our galaxy is full of dust, and if you look up on a clear night, you can see those dark lanes in the Milky Way, and that's the dust, and that prevents us from seeing all the way to the galactic centre. But if we look at the infrared, here's a, a Eukert infrared picture, then we can see through all that dust, and we can see what's happening in the centre. What is happening? <laughs> we believe there's a black hole at the yes. centre of our galaxy, of course. Um, of course, we can't see a black hole. That's by the nature of black holes. But what we can see is the very hot material orbiting around the black hole. This is a picture taken from the James Clark Maxwell telescope. And that operates at sub-millimetre wavelengths. That's correct, Patrick. Now, sub-millimetre wavelengths are even longer wavelength than, than the infrared, somewhere between the infrared and the radio. Yes. And the JCMT is the world's largest sub-millimetre telescope. Well, Chris is actually out there at the JCMT, so let's go back to Hawaii. Down below the ridge on which Eukert sits lies sub-millimetre valley and the JCMT, or James Clark Maxwell Telescope. Unlike the telescopes up here, it can happily observe during the day and owes its unique appearance to the world's largest piece of Gore-Tex, a windshield that happens to be invisible in the submillimeter. So Gary, what is the submillimeter? Well Chris, the submillimeter is really just another form of light and there are actually many different types of light and you'll be familiar with optical light which we see with our eyes, with x-rays, with radio waves and of course with the infrared which is used at Eukert. These are all just different types of light. It's just that the human eye is only sensitive to visible light, which is only a small part. Well, with the JCMT, we study the submillimeter, which is yet another form of light. And submillimeter comes from objects in the sky which are cold. So, roughly, we're measuring the heat signatures of objects in the sky which are cold. How cold? Well, really cold, actually. We're talking temperatures less than 50 Kelvin or so. So that's within 50 Kelvin of absolute zero. So when I say heat signature of cold objects, it's a bit oxymoronic. But that is actually what we're trying to do. And what are we doing up here on top of this volcano? Well, submillimeter astronomy is actually very difficult, and there are a number of technical challenges. And the reason we have to come to Hawaii is because submillimeter light from objects in space is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere and it's absorbed far more so than is the case with optical light, for instance. Or radio. Or radio, absolutely. So if we were to stand out here at night and look up at the sky above Mauna Kea, you would see with your eye all of the stars in the sky, and it's a magnificent sight. But in the submillimeter, you wouldn't see that, because a lot of the submillimeter light from the sky is absorbed on the way through, and so if we had submillimeter eyes, it would actually look foggy. And so we're always looking through fog in the submillimeter. Now the reason we come to Mauna Kea is to get above all of the weather systems because it's the water in the atmosphere that does the absorbing. And here at 14,000 feet on this mountain, we are above 97% of the water in the Earth's atmosphere. And that's why we have to come here. There are very few places on Earth where you would ever even dream of attempting this type of astronomy. And this is one of the best here in Submillimeter Valley. And you mentioned that we're looking for cold objects, but what sort of things are you, do you see? Oh, well, there, actually, most of the material in the universe is cold, and that's quite surprising. But to give you a few examples, the interstellar medium between stars in the galaxy is, is not empty space. It's absolutely full of stuff. It's full of molecules in the gas form, and uh, there are a lot of dust particles as well, and we can measure both of these things using different types of instruments on this telescope. And the great thing about submillimeter astronomy, which of course I should have mentioned at the beginning, is that we use submillimeter astronomy to study these origins questions. How do stars form? How do galaxies form? And how do planetary systems form? The big questions. These are the big questions of modern astronomy, absolutely. The telescope looks rather like a radio dish, but it's not. It's a mirror because the wavelength of the light we're using is much shorter, the mirror must be smoother. Now the light comes in through the windshield, hits the mirror, goes up to the secondary, and is reflected down through the hole into the receiver cabin, which looks rather like the TARDIS. And it feels like the TARDIS as well, crowded with instruments. This tertiary mirror here selects which one is going to be used, and therefore which wavelength we can monitor the sky in. The instruments can only work at extremely low temperatures in order to prevent their background noise overwhelming the tiny signals from space. As the instrument is cooled using liquid gas, normally nitrogen or helium, the atoms inside slow down. The ultimate would be to reach absolute zero, minus 273 degrees centigrade, when the atoms have no kinetic energy at all, when they're completely stopped. That's impossible in practice, but one instrument gets very close indeed. This is SCUBA, now retired from eight years' hard work on the telescope. When it was running,
the detector chamber was cooled to just 100 millikelvin, making it the largest known volume in the universe to be that cold. Before it came along, we had to map the submillimeter sky one pixel at a time, but SCUBA is a camera, and the images it produced were revolutionary, showing us new details from everything from new solar systems to distant galaxies. So, you've been using the JCMT, and what, what have you been working on? Well, my interest is in planetary systems, maybe trying to find some like our own. And we're using a very unusual method, using submillimeter astronomy. So um, if you were to look at the solar system from the outside with the submillimeter camera, you'd see very cold things like Pluto, for example, comets. And in particular, you'd see the debris, the fallout of collisions of comets, which happen very rarely around our own sun, but they do happen. This produces a shower of little cold particles which emit in the submillimeter. So we couldn't actually detect an individual like large rock, like the Earth, for example. But if you smashed it all up and spread it around a solar system, you'd have so much emitting surface of little rocks that then you could detect it with a camera like Scuba. It's like inside-out astronomy. We don't see the star, and we see the cold stuff on the outside. Exactly. It's the perfect way of picking out the cold outskirts of the solar system or another planetary system. And of course detecting it is fun, but what, what you want to do is take a photo, and for that you need SCUBA. Yes, yeah, SCUBA was amazing. It was the first real submillimeter camera. So before that we had instruments that could measure submillimeter light, but it was almost like doing a, a join the dots. You get one measurement and you get another measurement, and you try and build them up very slowly into a picture, whereas SCUBA just took the picture, so it was an amazing breakthrough. Well, let's look at some examples. Why don't we start with Formalhort? Yeah, Fommelholtz is um, one of the first stars we looked at, so it's a very bright star and what we detected, as you can see in the images, is a ring of dust around the star made by these cometary collisions. And that was really exciting, but we also found this kind of an extra lump of dust at one point and the only real reason that can be there is if it's marshalled by the gravity of a planet. And this was not only really exciting, but it told us that planetary systems can be very different from each other because to produce this cold stuff so far out from the star the planet has to be a long way out. So it might be something like Neptune, but three times further away from the star. Well, so much for these large, massive, energetic young stars. What about stars like our sun? And one of those is Tor Ceti. Yes, um, that was really difficult. That's the faintest thing we've done so far. But it's fascinating because it's a star that's very like the sun, but it's actually twice as old. It's 10 billion years old. So in a way, we could be peering into our own future. We wanted to look at this and see what the environment would be like. But what we found was actually really startling. It may never have been quite like the solar system because the amount of rocky particles we detect imply that around this star there's something like 20 times as many comets as there is around our sun, even though it's a much older system. So if you were standing on a hypothetical planet around this star, you'd see comets streaking through your night sky overhead. You know, you'd be at risk of a giant meteor landing right in front of you. It would be a very dangerous place, in fact, for life to try and evolved. When SCUBA was turned on, it very quickly made discoveries both expected and unexpected. One of the most surprising was a whole population of distant galaxies shining brightly in the submillimeter. They've become increasingly important to modern astronomy and are now called SCUBA galaxies. Well, um, Chris had a good look at SCUBA and I'm joined now by Dr. Rob Iverson of the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. Rob, welcome to the sky at night. Pleasure to be here. What about SCUBA? Well, SCUBA resembles nothing more than a large red hot water emotion tank, but it is in fact a technological marvel. It's a testament to the genius of British engineering that managed to cool two cameras that take pictures at one millimeter and roughly half a millimeter to a temperature of only one tenth of a degree above absolute zero. Why do you have to go as cold as that? You have to go as cold as that because of the large background that that camera sees. It sees the sky glowing, it sees the telescope, it sees all the surroundings and it needs to be able to detect unbelievably faint signals from cold material in the distant universe. We hear a lot about scuba galaxies. What are scuba galaxies? Scuba galaxies are very intensely star-forming galaxies. We're talking about galaxies that pump out roughly the equivalent of a trillion times the luminosity of the Sun. Uh, and typically they'll be forming stars at a rate of hundreds every year. Massive stars that will uh, live fast, die young, go supernova. And what we see is the energy from those hot young stars 
that's been absorbed by the cocoons of dust that they are born in and that they create themselves. And that dust then re-radiates that emission at a wavelength of around 100 microns, which SCUBA, observing very distant galaxies, picks up at its, at its rest frame filter wavelength of about 850 microns. How do you recognize a SCUBA galaxy? Well, SCUBA galaxies aren't the prettiest galaxies in the universe when they're initially detected. They resemble nothing more than blobs. And in fact, uh, the whole science, in some sense, became known as blobology, because all we see is a blob on a very low resolution image. It's typically about 15 arc seconds across. Uh, and that means that if you go and look at that piece of sky with a very deep optical or infrared image, uh, you will find quite often half a dozen or more possible counterpart galaxies underneath. And what has to happen then is that someone like me has to go away to the Very Large Array radio telescope in New Mexico and use the, the radio emission to pinpoint exactly which galaxy is responsible for the submillimeter emission. And then a whole process of obtaining extremely deep infrared and optical observations until almost always it turns out we discover a morphologically disturbed star forming galaxy. How do these scuba galaxies fit into the general scheme of things? Well it turns out Patrick that these scuba galaxies or some millimeter selected galaxies are absolutely key to our understanding of the early universe because they they represent the missing link the local universe is known to contain large elliptical galaxies. Until now, we've never really had much of an idea of where those galaxies formed. And for many years, people have speculated where in the distant universe, where is this population? Scuba galaxies are now believed to be that population. They form stars at a pro prodigious rate. They can form sufficient stars to make a large elliptical galaxy in only a few hundred million years. And therefore, and they do so almost entirely obscured from view in the optical, which explains why they haven't been found before. So they are an absolutely crucial uh, part of the big picture of, of galaxy formation, and in fact the formation of galaxies, supermassive black holes, uh, almost everything that we know to be important in the local universe. I gather that SCUBA has now come to the end of its career. Why is that? The position it occupies on the Naismith platform of the telescope has to be cleared to make way for its successor, SCUBA 2, which is a phenomenally uh, exciting development. SCUBA mapped 1,000 times faster than its predecessor. SCUBA 2 will map 1,000 times faster than SCUBA. And the, uh, the scientific potential is almost limitless. Well, Rob, thank you very much for... Chris has been in Edinburgh looking at Scuba 2, so over now to Edinburgh. Well, pretty though it is, Edinburgh in the winter's not quite Hawaii, but behind me are the domes of the Royal Observatory, and down below is the UK Astronomy Technology Centre. Here, they build instruments destined for telescopes all over the world, and in particular, we're here to see Scuba 2, the world's most advanced submillimeter camera, which will end up on the JCMT. This is Scuba 2, this is the size of the main instrument, and this is the insides of the instrument. What you've seen here is the, the section which actually houses the two arrays. Um, the arrays themselves will be cooled down to 0.1 degree of absolute zero, minus 273 Celsius. Wow, that's really very <laughs> that's cold pretty indeed. cold, yeah. Basically, if we can get them very, very cold, we make them very, very, very sensitive uh, detectors. And uh, most of the volume here you can see um, is actually a cryogenic system to cool the, the arrays down to that very low temperature. And those arrays, which work simultaneously, are just two cameras? Basically, yeah, just two cameras, yeah. And like a digital camera that you take off the shelf, the number of pixels <laughs> is crucial. That's right. Um, the Scuba One camera that's been working on the JCMT is 100 pixels, and uh, that's good, very good going for the submillimeter. It's quite a technical challenge to build that many pixels. Uh, Scuba Two has something like 10,000 pixels. So that's a two orders of magnitude increase in the number of pixels. And that means you can cover a much larger area of the sky. That's, that's right. The, the main emphasis behind the SCUBA 2 instrument is to do wide field surveys, from surveys of very distant high redshift galaxies to surveys of star formation in molecular clouds, um, and also looking at disks around nearby stars which may be forming solar systems or maybe form solar systems. Something like 1% of the sky has been studied in any great detail in the submillimeter. 
And the consequence of that is we've only looked at a handful of these disks, so we don't really have any statistics about how common they are, what really, are they really the size of our own solar system, what's going on. With SCUBA 2, what we're planning to do is look at 500 stars and hopefully detect a large percentage of disks around these stars, and then we'll be able to say something about maybe how common our solar system is around nearby stars and whether they're planets and so on. SCUBA 2 has been on the drawing board for a long time, but work is now progressing at full speed with the aim of having the camera on the telescope and ready for science by the end of the year. Back at the JCMT in Hawaii, work is already underway to prepare for SCUBA 2's arrival. With such a massive instrument coming, the whole structure has to be strengthened and there's a lot still to do. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the telescope, the other major new instrument, HARP, is ready for action. HARP is a spectrograph, splitting the radiation from the sky into its constituent wavelengths. The resulting pattern reveals the fingerprint of the chemicals which make up the object being studied. Carbon monoxide will emit radiation at one set of wavelengths, hydrogen cyanide, for example, at another set of wavelengths. With careful analysis, the shape and the intensities of these spectral lines can yield information about temperature, density, or even the movement of the gas making up the object. So HARP's sitting on the telescope behind us, but what is it? OK, HARP is an imaging spectrometer. That's to say it's a device that can make an image, but at each point in the image, we get a spectrum so we can find out what is there in the sky. And that's a huge advance on the kind of receivers that we've had before. Exactly. In the past, we've been poking around with just either making an image or making one spectrum. Now we can do the two simultaneously. So how does it work? OK. The signals arrive at the telescope. They are focused and they come out through this hole in the bearing here, where there's an encoder. They're focused onto a mirror, second mirror down here. This mirror, in fact, can tip so that it can either look at the signals from the telescope or it can be looking at a calibration unit, which is over here. Then they go into this big blue beastie we call the cryostat. That's because everything after this has to be kept cold. In fact, you can read the temperature on the gauge up there. It says four. Now, that's four degrees above absolute zero. So it's minus 269 degrees centigrade. The reason the detectors have to be that cold is that they rely on superconductivity. Um, a number of different metals when they get very cold, become superconductors. And niobium, in particular, becomes a superconductor at a little bit above four degrees. When the signals, these faint signals from the astronomical sky, fall on this superconducting detector, they cause electrons to tunnel through junctions which are built into these detectors. And that's the effect that we can actually see. Um, and that's what we use to uh, make our the signal something that we can then analyze in our spectrometer. So, so much for the theory. How's it going in practice? Well, uh, we got the instrument here about a month ago, uh, and we got it mounted up on the telescope. It's all working very nicely. So, mostly it's software from now on. Commissioning a new instrument takes a remarkable amount of time and effort just to ensure that HARP and the JCMT are working together properly. Now, finally, it's time to turn the telescope to the sky and see what it can do. This is just a great time to talk to me, Chris, because we've just got this fantastic mapping of the Orion Bright Bar, and this is the most ambitious observation we've made with the array so far. Let me show you on, on the screen here. Um, what we've got uh, here in, in the central screen is uh, an image of the uh, carbon monoxide emission from uh, basically the, the M42 nebula in Orion. And uh, here is the, uh, the trapezium cluster up here, which is where it would be in the optical in infrared. And down here is the bright bar. This huge, wide, very bright line that's the gas that's been accelerated by, by the protostars. And then in the bar, quite a strong uh, emission line, but a shape that varies very, in a very pronounced way as we move across it. And, and encoded in these spectra, there's vast amounts of information about the properties of the gas and uh, what, what's happening in these clouds. And this is very exciting because this is the first time we've made, we've made a really good picture w with HARP, and it tells us that fundamentally most of the, the software, uh, most of the hardware is, is working well. Every time you build a new instrument, you make new discoveries, you try and understand the, the underlying physics behind the process, and that just leads to new questions. And therefore, that new, instrument. to new instruments. Absolutely. And so, what information will we get? What will we be sitting here talking well, about in well, two years' time? Well, just if I can give you just one example, and that's the scuba galaxies, of course. It's the headline example from scuba. We have something like 100 scuba galaxies that we've detected over the eight years. With scuba 2, we will have thousands. And that means we enter a completely new paradigm, you see. 
so far with SCUBA, we've looked at these 100 galaxies and we've tried to measure their properties as individual objects. Now we will have statistical samples and we can start doing real statistics of how the universe has evolved. Like taking a census rather than just asking a few random people questions. Th that's a good analogy actually, that's right. What we're really talking about here, Chris, with all these new instruments and the new back-end computer and the new electronics for the coral laser, uh, is a complete renovation of the observatory. And this happens from time to time in the life cycle of observatories. In the, for the JCMT context, I would say that we're going from the second generation, which SCUBA represented, and the other receivers, to the third generation with SCUBA 2 and HARP. As wonderful though it is to see the professional telescopes up on the mountain, I want to spend some time looking up at the night sky. So I've come down to the visitor's centre, just 9,000 feet above sea level, where the public gather 365 nights a year to take part in organised star watching sessions. Okay, what you're looking at right there is a galaxy that is about 2 million light years away. And it is the furthest object you can see with the naked eye. Cells, and they were discovered. This is the moon, and uh, just taking a little tour with the telescope. It's nice. So you've got it's being projected on the the side. That's excellent. Yeah. So I can actually see from here as well. This is the North Star, also known as Polaris. Can you see the fuzzy bit in the middle? Yeah. Very faint. Yeah. That's the Andromeda Galaxy. It's two million light years away. Saturn was one of the first things I ever saw through a telescope, and it's rising behind me now. It's always wonderful to see people's reaction when they catch a glimpse of it through a telescope. So you're looking at the planet Saturn? Oh man, there he is! Wow, <laughs> that's really cool. Oh, I see the rings too. Is that cool? Up here on the summit, the quality of the sky is obvious, despite the wind. There's Castor and Pollux in the constellation of Gemini, above its namesake, the 8-metre Gemini Telescope. The constellation represents the twins, and there are other twins up here too, the Keck telescopes down below. Even up here at 14,000 feet, the stars twinkle because of the movement of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, if we could just keep track of that movement by watching a bright star very closely, we can correct for it, effectively putting one of these large telescopes up into space, a process known as adaptive optics. Imagine light coming from a distant object. Having travelled for thousands or even millions of years, it enters the Earth's atmosphere and is promptly ruined. The air's moving rapidly, distorting the previously perfect image. Light from a nearby bright star, though, will be distorted in exactly the same way. And so by monitoring that light, we can move a correcting mirror 50 or 100 times a second, getting rid of most of the effects from the atmosphere. Unfortunately, not every object of interest has a convenient bright star sitting right next to it, a problem astronomers have solved by firing lasers out into the night sky. The laser is tuned so that when it hits a thin layer of sodium, which happens to lie above most of the atmosphere, the sodium's excited and it glows. Light from that artificial star is distorted in just the same way as an astronomical object, and so the scientists can use that to monitor the atmosphere and remove its effects. Gemini's mirror is over 8 metres across and only 20 centimetres thick. It's this thinness that allows them to control its shape with an accuracy equivalent to the thickness of one thousandth of a human hair. Although the mirror's made of aluminium, it's coated in an extremely thin layer of silver in order to reflect as much infrared light as possible. Just two ounces, or about 50 grams, is enough to cover the entire mirror. The dome is always kept at nighttime temperatures throughout the day, and I can promise you, it's extremely cold. The instruments cover the entire range from the uh, uh, short wavelength optical, the shortest wavelengths that your eye can see, all the way out into the far infrared where the atmosphere cuts off. And so let's start at the beginning, the shortest wavelengths. Uh, the shortest wavelength instrument is uh, here is called GMOS, the Gemini Multi-Object Spectrograph. It's actually an imager, a camera, as well as a spectrograph. And you've got some marvelous pictures with GMOS. Well, one of the most uh, amazing uh, examples probably isn't a marvelous picture, apart from the fact that the objects are so faint. And these are these uh, amazing gamma ray bursters, uh, apparently supernovae in distant galaxies of a particular type that, that for a few uh, seconds uh, are emitting as much light as, as uh, the rest of the universe combined. The biggest and, bang since the big one. Yes. They're very, very short-lived, so when one is found, we're put on alert and we observe them as quickly as possible. 
uh, because they fade out very rapidly. Let's move on. Let's go into the infrared. Which All right. one's next? The next instrument is the Near Infrared Imager and Spectrograph, known as NERI, and uh, it's been used for a wide range of uh, science. The images that have been taken over the last year or so of Titan, uh, those images have used adaptive optics. Without adaptive optics, Titan from here would just be a blur. But with adaptive optics, we can really see uh, a lot of detail on Titan. Uh, but those images allow us to monitor the uh, weather on Titan because we can see the clouds moving, we can see them forming and, and disappearing. So let's move on to the last instrument, which is Michelle. And the results that spring to mind, for me at least, are the dust disks. That's right. Uh, in the last few years, uh, people have found dust disks around a number of uh, fairly young stars, and it's believed that these objects could be forming planets, and Michelle has been a prime instrument in use to study the properties of the dust, uh, not only the size of the disk, but the properties of the dust particles themselves. And has gotten some very interesting data, which some of which indicates that at least in one disk, there was recently a collision between two asteroids, which produced a lot of very, very fine dust grains, much finer than the ones that we normally see around these stars. And that gives you an idea of how much dust is being picked up. To see something produced by two asteroids is quite impressive. At That's the right. Of these, yeah, these, stars. these instruments on big, sensitive telescopes are amazingly good at detecting very, very minor events in the history of a, of a distant solar system. Well, there's lots more still to come. One last question, though. I've always said Gemini. You say Gemini. Which of us is right? Well, I'm right, of course, because <laughs> I took Latin, and in Latin, you pronounce Gemini, Gemini, just like you pronounce, well, even in English, you pronounce bikini, bikini. You don't say bikini. Gemini's dome opening at sunset is an amazing sight. It's designed to allow a smooth flow of wind across the telescope, keeping the air steady and the mirror clean. As the sun sets here, a twin telescope, Gemini South, is opening to view the southern sky from the mountains of Chile. It's a uh, partnership between the, the twin telescopes, one here in Hawaii, one in uh, Chile, and they work together to provide seamless coverage of the entire sky. Because, of course, being in the south in Chile, you see a whole host of different objects than we do here. That's right. Personally, I, I don't understand why everyone in the southern hemisphere isn't an astronomer. The sky is just spectacular there. You get a beautiful view of the center of our galaxy and the many star clusters that are found there. Um, and, of course, there's the two nearest satellite galaxies to the Milky Way, the large and small Magellanic clouds, which are just phenomenal. And you get really, really nice views from Gemini South. Well, you mentioned star clusters, and there's some exciting new results. That's right. Uh, star clusters are these ancient uh, systems of stars that orbit the Milky Way galaxy and many other galaxies, and so they're providing insights to how our galaxy might have been born and how other galaxies might have been born as uh, well. And what do they tell you? Well, they're telling us that it looks like most galaxies are formed by uh, cannibalism, by gobbling up many smaller galaxies, perhaps dozens, hundreds, maybe more uh, over their lifetime. So it's a bit of a violent universe, and if you're a small galaxy, you have to watch out. It's a beautiful night up here on the rather windy ridge in front of Gemini. The moon has just set behind the Keck telescopes and the Southern Cross is rising behind me. Over on the right, you can see the whole of Scorpius reaching right down and the center of our galaxy with all the targets that implies just rising. Hercules is up behind me and the most beautiful sight is Jupiter shining high in the sky there. It's an absolutely wonderful night. It gives you a really good idea of why this is one of the best sights in the world for observing sunrise and with the domes closing all around us and the shadow of the mountains stretching out on the clouds below me it's time for the astronomers to head down for some well-earned rest meanwhile let's go over to our last two telescopes the Kex, for a decade or so the largest anywhere in the world the first of the twin telescopes started operating in 1993 the second three years later and they've been hitting the headlines ever since they work closely with other observatories, which provide interesting targets to follow up with the more powerful eyes of Keck. This is Keck 2, and to be here in front of it is simply incredible. It's immense. The mirror is 10 meters across, and yet it has this lightweight, slotted appearance, which is designed to reduce the stress on the telescope as it moves around. Instruments have been added ever since the telescope arrived up here. Most of them are on the Naismith platforms behind me, but this silver tube sends the laser for the adaptive optic system out into the night sky. The most distinctive feature, though, is the hexagonal segmented mirror. Each of the 72 mirror segments that make up the two telescopes are brought down here to the mirror barn about once every 18 months. Here, they're coated with a very thin layer of aluminium, which provides the best possible reflecting surface. 
Combining segments like this produces a large reflecting surface, capable of collecting twice as much light as Gemini without putting a large brittle mirror under stress. This collecting area comes in useful for all kinds of projects. Tonight's astronomer is Professor Jeff Marcy, in the middle of a week-long observing run, hunting for planets. We can go to the next star now, Maddie. Right away. His and targets are too small to be seen directly, so instead, he looks for tiny changes due to the influence on the planet on its parent star. As the planet orbits, it pulls on the star, and we see that as a wobble as the star moves first towards us and then away again. The wobble's still too small to be seen directly, the star's moving at only running speed, 10 metres per second or so, and Jeff relies on the Doppler effect. When the star's moving away from us, its light is stretched, and so there's a shift towards longer wavelengths, towards the red in its spectrum. When it's coming towards us, the light is compressed slightly, and we see a tiny shift to the blue. It's this small effect which betrays the presence of a planet. Well, I'm here using the Keck telescopes, hoping to find the first rocky planets, small Earth-like planets, orbiting nearby stars. The Keck telescopes have two special attributes. First, of course, they are still the largest telescopes in the world, and we are starved for photons. We need more light to detect this Doppler shift very precisely. And the other reason is, is that there's a marvelous spectrometer in the basement of the Keck telescope that gathers the starlight and spreads it out into all of its colors, blue, green, yellow, and red, from the original white starlight. And that spectrometer is ideally suited to measure this Doppler effect very precisely. We have found an amazing variety of other planets, in fact a much greater diversity than we ever imagined when we started. We have found planets bigger than our own Jupiter, which is the biggest in our solar system. We have found Saturn-like planets, Neptune-like planets, even one seven and a half Earth masses. And the remarkable thing is that we have found some planets that orbit not in circular orbits, but in elongated orbits, like comets reside in. That we never expected such bizarre orbits, and we have found many planets that orbit close into their host stars. So we're finding a zoo of planets, and who knows what other beasts are out there. The point is to find out how unusual our own solar system is. Well, many of the planetary systems we've found are very, very different. But a few of them remind us of home. Some of them have a Jupiter out there far from the host star, gravitationally sweeping up the debris, the comets and the asteroids, rendering any Earths that might be inward of that Jupiter safe from the bombardment. Which planetary systems stick in your mind? By far the most exciting planetary system is uh, the one orbiting the star Gliese 876. It's only some 15 light years away. And what's amazing about Gliese 876 is that we discovered two Jupiters orbiting it fairly close, at sort of a Venus-like distance, in a two-to-one resonance. One planet goes around twice for every single orbit of the other planet. But while we were watching that system carefully, we discovered a third planet, one that's only seven times the mass of our own Earth. And it's about 30 times closer to the star than our Earth is to the Sun. But the beautiful part is that the star is very low luminosity. It's a so-called M dwarf star, so low luminosity that the planet would be bathed by a very faint glow of starlight, keeping the planet warm, in fact about 80 degrees Celsius. And it may have a hard surface allowing life to be possible. One thing occurs to me, planets seem to be common, Earth-like systems you think are common. Why haven't we detected life until now? Well, it's interesting, you know, life really doesn't make much of a footprint on its host planet. We, of course, are affecting our own planet Earth, uh, dramatically indeed, frighteningly, but when you think about other planets far away, uh, any life, indeed advanced life, would not make such a detectable effect. I'm sure that in the next decade and decades, we will be imaging Earth-like planets, detecting the continents and the oceans and, of course, the signs of life on those planets. It will be a glorious day when we can look up and realize we have friends out in the cosmos. For our last night in Hawaii, we're leaving the mountaintop behind and joining Jeff down in the Keck control room, 9,000 feet below. Complete. We can go to the next star now, Maddie. He remains in touch with the telescope via a video link, but benefits from the extra oxygen available down there. All of these computers actually run the spectrometer 
that is the device that spreads the starlight into all of its wavelengths or colors, and we analyze those colors for the Doppler effect. This screen here monitors the starlight as it comes in, and then the exposure is automatically finished, like a camera shutter closing, literally, uh, when we've gathered enough photons. So you say, I need half a million photons. Or Exa whatever. That's exactly right. We, s we know exactly how many, and it's typically a half a million photons per color. And when that occurs, this graph uh, senses it, and the exposure is automatically truncated. This whole uh, display allows us to modify the spectrometer. We mm -hmm. can tilt lenses and diffraction gratings, change the entrance aperture, and so on. And then here is the result. This is actually the final spectrum that we get from the star. All of these horizontal lines that you barely can see represent the light from the star spread out into all of its wavelengths. So it's not as simple as a large window popping up and saying, yes, you found three planets. Today. Right, yeah, collect your money at the <laughs> latest planet station. No, it, it'll actually take a few months to analyze these data to see if there are planets in there. Tonight we're observing the 35 nearest stars in the sky, sun-like stars, hoping to find small rocky planets orbiting very close to those stars with orbital periods of no more than a few weeks or months. Why do we assume that all small planets are rocky? The reason is that if a small planet were made of gas, the gravity of the planet couldn't hold on to the gaseous molecules and they would just fly away. So if you take a bag of gas and get rid of the bag, the gas just dissipates. The Earth's lost all its hydrogen, for example. Indeed, the Earth has lost uh, hydrogen and most of the helium, so the Earth is already just on the edge of losing most of its atmosphere. Hopefully it won't. Readout complete. Okay, Maddie, we'll start on this one. Stand by. So I've already taken one exposure. We're going to take four starting right now. Why five of that star in particular? This is an interesting star. It's a sun-like star. It's uh, HD 19373. It has a well-known name, Iota Persei. You oh, see okay. it with the naked eye. And because it is like the sun, we know that sun-like stars pulsate. Our own sun has an oscillation period of five minutes. Right. Our sun breathes out and in, out and in. These stars almost certainly are pulsating as well. And because of that, we get a false Doppler signal. And it has nothing to do with the planet, it's just the star pulsating. So our goal in taking, taking five exposures is to average over those pulsations of the star. So we specifically take five exposures that are timed to give us uh, a sampling of one full oscillation period. And by averaging over that, what's left over, if there's any velocity variation, is due to a planet. Thus enabling you to look at sun-like stars despite this pulsation. And also to detect the smallest possible planets around sun-like stars. And that's, of course, an exciting holy grail. We would like to find Earth-like rocky planets around stars that are very much like the sun. Okay, I'm shooting. Let's see. Yeah, I'm going to tune this back to 150,000, Maddie. Okay. Okay. What, what are you looking for? What makes it a planet? Well, that's a good question. I'll show you a great planet. Okay. One of the greatest planets in planet hunting history. Okay. These are the data for the star HD 187123. Memorable name as ever. A British student at the University of Sussex sent me an email once and it said, Dear Dr. Marcy, I hope you don't mind my making a suggestion, but I think you should observe the star HD 187123. And I thought to myself, the audacity of this British schoolboy telling me what stars I should observe. And I thought, well, why not? Let's go ahead and do it. Sure enough, you see the velocity of the star over the course of time wow. varying dramatically and sinusoidally. We're starting this new exposure. It's repeating over and over and has repeated since 1998. And as a result, we call it Planet Kevin, after <laughs> Kevin Apps, the student at University of Sussex, who suggested we observe this star. Well, let's hope there's many more to come for tonight. I'll <laughs> let you get back to work. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Of course, Keck isn't just a planet hunting machine, it has the whole rest of the universe to play with. Sometimes, as I saw the Kecks, I'm afraid, I'm joined now by Professor Richard Ellis, Director of the Caltech Observatories. Richard, welcome back to the sky at night. Thank you very much, Patrick. What do you think have been the highlights of Keck over the last ten years? Oh, that's a tough one. Ten years at any observatory, a lot of interesting discoveries. My personal favourites would be the, the accelerating universe, the fact that we use supernovae yes, yes. to determine that the universe is not just expanding, but that the expansion is getting faster with time. 
a completely unexpected result. Nobody really expected to yeah. find that result. I would say that's probably my favorite. Uh, opening up the distant universe, of course, traditionally the challenge of large telescopes to find the earliest objects in the universe. Keck has, I think, made great uh, strides in finding populations of galaxies at very, very early times. And then perhaps gamma ray bursts, the most energetic objects in the universe, proving that they were indeed outside the Milky Way. I have to go back and remember, many people thought they might even be in the solar system. So uh, I think those would be my top three. But an observatory is a changing place, and so really in order to stay at the frontier, we have to provide new capabilities. And the latest news is we have a laser guide star that enables us to use our adaptive optics system to correct for the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Of course, astronomers need to get used to the idea of adaptive optics. For yeah. many years, it's been a, an expert's game. And so with this laser, now we can uh, make corrections anywhere in the sky. And so that's going to mean that ordinary astronomers will be able to uh, correct for the uh, turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Not just get sharp pictures, Patrick, but also yes. use spectra. So the first results coming out of the laser guide star are very exciting. Probably the most exciting results are the galactic center. We've known for some time there's a massive black hole in the center of the galaxy. With this laser, of course, we can get much sharper images of the actual individual stars orbiting the black hole. Uh, we can actually get the shapes of each individual orbit, and so we can determine exactly how the black hole is arranged. And, excitingly, we see flares of light in the infrared coming from material that we think is falling into the black hole. This would not have been possible without the sharpness of the corrections made possible by the laser. Another very interesting development is to study distant galaxies and find out whether they're rotating, and hence are they becoming early spiral galaxies. Millions of light years away? Millions of light years away. These are very distant galaxies. They're very, very small. And, of course, Hubble has shown us uh, that many of them do have spiral forms, but one really would like to study the motions of the stars in these galaxies. You need a big aperture to do that, so you need the combination of adaptive optics uh, and Keck. And then, perhaps lastly, close to home, we find that many of the outer objects in the icy wastes of the solar system, the so-called Kuiper Belt yes. objects, have satellites. They have, uh, a large fraction of them seem to have little objects orbiting around them. And this is very important in understanding how these early objects in the solar system formed. Again, you need the um, resolution of the Keck telescope and the laser in order to track uh, these uh, Kuiper Belt objects. And, of course, uh, the great thing about having an orbit of an object is that you can then determine its mass. And so this is a very important step forward in the solar system. These are the first uh, results that are coming out of the laser. And I think we will probably have five or ten years of exciting science to come out of uh, the laser science that is being done at Keck. You know, all the way through fairly recent science, we've tried to build bigger and bigger telescopes. Hales cry for more light. Right, right. It's amazing. When you look back over the last century, you know, the 100-inch, the 200-inch, the Keck telescopes, and now the proposed 30-metre telescopes, I just think it's mankind's relentless drive to learn more about the universe. Richard, thank you very much. Great observatories, great telescopes, exciting news. I wonder what lies ahead. Good night. Good night.